Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today, on this top seven series, I'm going to tackle or talk about something a little more dark and scary. Let's just say it involves cruise ships and the word disasters. Let's see what it is. So on today's episode of Top 7, of course, we're going to be talking about the Top 7 Cruise Ship Disasters. I think we all can think of two right away, one, two, three. Uh, but let's start with number one. Of course, number one, I probably should have did this backwards, but number one anyway, let's do number one, the biggest in history, the RMS Titanic. We all, I think you have to just, you have to be a baby right now or just grown up in a remote location to never have heard of the Titanic or the sinking of the Titanic. I think it's got to be, well, it is the number one cruise ship disaster. So anyway, let's read more about it. So on April 14th, 1912, that's the date in that will forever live in infamy. Uh, somebody in my house, my wife, remembers that date every year. I forget it and she remembers it. Um, it's It impacted a lot of people's lives. It still is. The movie did. Just all the history and the stories of the survivors and the, the great people that were lost and the captain going down with the ship. It's just one of those poetically kind of dark stories that we all kind of know. So anyway... Of course, on that night, April 14th, 1912, the Titanic collided with an iceberg. And we all know what happened thanks to Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet and James Cameron and Kathy Bates and all those people. I, I can't name them all. Bill Paxton, rest in peace. A lot of good talent. Very good movie. I'm sh I know I've watched it more than 10 times. Can't remember when I last watched it, but I will never forget that movie. Or the whole problem with the Titanic sinking, in my opinion, was a lot of the people in the upper decks and even the staff and crew who weren't in the below decks, they were kind of like nonchalant for way too long about it. It was impossible that this ship, brand new, named Titanic, elmed to be one of the biggest, fastest, strongest, you know, unsinkable ships. It is sinking. And I think a lot of people just refuse to accept that reality and it's impossible. This is the first voyage. So it actually collided the 14th, but it didn't actually sink until technically the 15th, it's saying. Uh, early hours of April 15th. And insufficient lifeboats, lack of coordination and training, and the lack of like reality about it that we have to act now resulted in the loss of more than 1,500 lives. The Titanic sinking had a profound change in maritime law and the way they do things. Uh, a lot of things changed that time. So the Titanic is number one, and I think it's number one in all of our minds. Number two. Number two is the freshest, biggest thing, I think, in our minds. It happened in 2012 on board the Costa Concordia. We all know what kind of happened, very sad, but the cruise ran aground on January 13th, 2012, off the coast of Giglio or Giglio, Italy. The ship deviated from its planned course. We all kind of know what happened. The captain is, was, is in big trouble. It struck a reef and the ship's captain was criticized for delaying the order to abandon ship. Tragically, 32 people lost their lives. And then we all, of course, remember seeing the wreckage for some time just sitting there off the coast on that reef, kind of just, it fully like turned on its side, but it prevented it from falling further off, they said, in a way that helped save some people's uh, lives. That was the most recent thing, and I think of that quite often. I don't know why, but the image of it, and the news media really ran with that for quite some time, the image of it just sitting there, and then once it was taken out of the water and uprighted, the, the way the water level lines looked on everything and they did a tour of the ship. A lot of things changed in the cruise industry too at that point. A reassessment of safety protocols, 
deviation from course. That's one of those things that it was totally preventable. And it caused a lot of issues with the Costa brand for quite some time. And I, it's one of those things I will never forget the imagery of that. And needless to say, it was preventable. Again, highly preventable. And it, it was all due to some sort of bravado type thing with the captain from what I re recall. But anyway, the Costa Concordia in 2012, January 13th, 2012. Very sad day. I don't know if I said it, but number three. Now, I haven't heard of this or I don't know this one, so I'm gonna kind of read this a little bit more. The SS Eastland, 1915. The SS Eastland was a passenger ship based in Chicago and operated by the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company. Wow. On July 24th, 1915, during a planned excursion across Lake Michigan, ooh, that water's cold, the ship rolled over and capsized, still tied to the dock in, in the Chicago River. The rapid capsizing in shallow waters prevented many passengers from escaping resulting in the loss of over 800 lives. The disaster was attributed to the ship's design and inadequate stability measures and overcrowding. It led to improved safety regulations, including stricter stability standards and the requirement for sufficient life-saving equipment on passenger vessels. I, I, I would have thought that the Titanic would have kind of nipped that in the bud, but I guess that was only three years later and maybe because it wasn't on the ocean it was more considered, oh, nothing's gonna happen. And if the ship design wasn't tested, I've never heard of that. So I'm, I'm gonna definitely hope I find some photos and I can add to this. But very interesting and also very preventable, it sounds like. I think a lot of these so far have been preventable. Like maybe the Titanic, some people can argue it wasn't preventable, but definitely I think it could have been preventable in my opinion. And back to that old thing, could have Jack floated on the piece of wood uh, with Rose, I don't know. <laughs> That's a big thing. I kind of think they could have because Rose was already wet and like some of her body was wet. So I think he didn't want to get on it because he didn't want her to fall into the water. But anyway, all right, I'm back. I had to change the battery and get uh, some more memory. So back to the SS Eastland. Uh, I've never heard of it, but that's interesting. I'm going to have to look at this because I never I never heard of something that had 800 lives lost in Lake Michigan area or Chicago River area, but that's pretty big. But anyway, just like Titanic, after this disaster, a lot of things went into place to changing the minimum requirements that ships, ferry ships, cruise ships, and sh large vessels that carried a lot of people uh, had safety-wise and evacuation-wise. So... Every disaster, we learn from it, basically. Sad as it is, we do get better, and hopefully we don't repeat that mistake. Number four. I've heard of this before, too. Uh, the MS Estonia in 1994, so not that long ago in the scheme of things. I'm going to read it, though, because I don't know it as well as the other ones. The MSC Estonia, a Swedish-owned ferry, sank in the Baltic Sea during a storm on September 28, 1994. The ship was en route from Tallinn, Estonia to Stockholm, Sweden when it encountered heavy waves. The bow visor, a large door-like structure at the ship's front failed due to the extreme weather conditions, allowing water to flood the car deck. The ship quickly lost stability and sank, claiming the lives of 852 people. I don't remember it being that costly. That That's very sad. Mostly to, due to drowning and hypothermia. The accident revealed design flaws in the ship's construction, including watertight integrity and sufficient emergency procedures. As a result, safety regulations were revised and enhanced the stability and safety features of the passenger ferries. That's Sounded preventable, but maybe not the accident itself, because how do you know it's going to fail? It was probably tested and rated to be fine. But then again, like 
maybe back then too our weather warnings weren't as advanced but i would think they would be that's not that far off what 30 something years 30 years it's just one of those things i think definitely the the amount of loss could have been mitigated at least or maybe if the procedures were in place no one could have been lost uh but that's very sad it sounded what happened like it it just happened so quick that there was no time for the crew to prepare or to help people and as far as i recall on ferries i've been on there's not that much crew to staff the ratio is much smaller than a regular passenger vessel maybe they were overwhelmed and i don't know there's no way to, to justify that kind of loss though so i just I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I never heard of that, and that's horrible. But anyway, I, again, I think a lot of this could have been prevented had the procedures been in place, the weather kind of, the heeds to the weather warnings and maybe better weather warnings, more preparedness on the crew's part, a bigger num number of crew to passenger ratio to help. And I don't know, that's, that's, that's really sad. Anyway, they, it, it looks like we did learn from that. And I haven't heard of anything like that recently, thankfully. But let's move on from that. This is a lot sadder than I thought it would be and scary, but I think it's a good, valuable lesson that you can never be too prepared or overprepared when at sea. Uh, the same thing goes for your individual safety. Like, listen to your gut feeling, I think, on a lot of things. Let's move on. Number five. Never heard of this one here. But the MV Wilhelm Gustav in 1945. Uh, the MV Wilhelm Gustav, originally built as a cruise ship for the German labor front, was requisitioned, requisitioned by the German Navy during World War II for use as a military transport. On January 30th, 1945, while evacuating German civilians and military personnel from East Prussia, the ship was torpedoed by a Soviet submarine in the Baltic Sea. The overcrowded vessel quickly sank, resulting in the loss of an estimated 9,000 to 10,000 lives, mainly civilians. The incident remains the deadliest maritime disaster in history. So we need to correct this. This is deadlier than the Titanic. I did not know that. Never heard of this myself, and I should have. Maybe I did. I just don't recall. But that's, that's, that's shocking. That's a... That's a lot of lives. The tragedy was compounded by the chaotic evac evacuation process, frigid water temperatures, and the lack of sufficient life-saving equipment. The disaster highlighted the urgency of providing effective evacuation and appropriate safety measures during wartime evacuations. I don't know if this could have been that preventable because it was caused by an attack, but again, maybe the fact that it was overcrowded, they weren't prepared with enough evacuation equipment, and the fact that it was probably overweight, overcrowded, because you bring your belongings, you bring yourself, some of your belongings. There's probably vehicles or something on there. <sighs> very sad, very sad. I did not know this one either. Um, a lot of history here. Sorry that this is so dark, but I think it's important to hear this. Uh, number six. This one, thankfully, is not there. I will say there's no loss of life, so yay. There's a little quick break. 2013, the Carnival Triumph. You may remember this, I remember this. This was, it, I, would, I don't know what I would do in this situation. But in 2013, the Carnival Triumph, a Carnival Cruise Line ship experienced an engine room fire on February 10th, 2013, sailing, while sailing in the Gulf of Mexico. The fire disabled the ship's propulsion and power systems, leaving it adrift for several days. Passengers endured unsanitary conditions limited food supplies, and loss of air conditioning, amongst other infrastructure. Eventually, the ship was towed to port. No lives were lost, but everybody was very upset. The incident drew attention from the media. I remember that running for a while. They're still out there. And they would show helicopter footage of people on deck uh, that they were getting sandwiches and I think they were lowering some things and then they evacuated some people who were in dire need of medical assistance via rope and helicopter. The incident drew attention to the issues such as fire prevention, backup systems, and emergency preparedness on the ship's part. 
It prompted discussions about the need for redundant systems and improved emergency response procedures in the industry. I remember this and it, it was shocking to me that the amount of food that they did not have, like ready to eat food that wasn't in need of refrigeration or cooking. So like what, breads, canned goods and that kind of, kind of thing. I was shocked that there wasn't that kind of minimum kind of rationing kind of thing, even if it's just not good quality, but at least something that had, uh, you know, sustaining nutrients in it. Uh, I will say, you know, this was in 2013. So 10 years later in 2023, we just got off the Carnival Horizon for our second time. And we did the behind the ships fun tour. So it took us to a lot of the behind the scenes, the crew areas. We went to the bridge. We also went to uh, the engineering deck, which is down low right at the sea level. They actually have control of all the systems and the guy there, one of the engineers, he's Italian, I don't remember his name, but he was very honest and he said now, he didn't say this incident in, in particular, but he said that they are so redundantly prepared that there's backup systems, there's backup generators or engines, there's tons of fuel in different areas. They, they make their own water, they don't rely just on ports anymore. So they can filter and desalinate water straight from the ocean for drinking and showering, but mainly drinking, that's the most important thing. They have tons of food and the capability to keep it fresh. He told me with the amount of fuel they have, they can sail for about a month. He said they could do two to three cruises. So he said about 27, something like that day kind of thing, week-long cruises. And as long as the weather's not bad and they're not trying to book it, they have the energy and the capability to move that vessel. Say if something happens, they can't get to this port or there's a hurricane here or one of the engines break down. They just have to sit there adrift, but they have the capability to keep the life support kind of things running. And I, he assured us and he showed us like the redundant, the, all the engines and generators on the, you know, they had them on screens and like lights and stuff. And I, I felt very comfortable with Carnival and, I think all cruise lines in general, I think Carnival just got unlucky that it happened to them, but I don't think they all, I think they all learned from that uh, moment in time and have corrected any potential for that happening or happening for that amount of time. We have heard, you know, there's been minor fires, you know, with the smokestacks and other things. They can't turn and they're whatever, but it happened, it, you know, instead of being at this long, it was this long and it was a much easier thing of course, the people are upset. That's their vacation and now they're trapped or they're going to be delayed. But this will never, I, I'm pretty sure will never happen again to that amount to, or to that degree. Carnival and all the cruise lines learned a valuable lesson in, in 2013. And I think 10 years later, they've, they're they overdoing it. But you can't overdo safety. So kudos, kudos. And again, this was no loss of life. So that's good. Number seven. The last one, number seven. I think I've heard of this, but I don't remember the name, but I remember the story. SS Sultana, 1865. So this is the oldest one now. The SS Sultana was a Mississippi River paddle wheeler primarily used to transport Union soldiers returning from the American Civil War. On April 27th, 1865, while heavily overloaded with over 2,000 passengers, the ship suffered a boiler expo explosion near Memphis, Tennessee. The explosion and subsequent fire caused the ship to sink, resulting in the loss of an estimated 1,800 to 2,400 lives. The disaster is often overshadowed by the end of the Civil War and the assassination of President Lincoln, which occurred around the same time. So that may be why a lot of us don't know it. The tragedy highlighted the dangers of overcrowding poor maintenance and inadequate safety standards on steamboats. It led to improvements in boiler safety regulations and stricter enforcement of passenger capacity limits on river vessels. That That's a lot of people for back then on any any kind of vessel. That's that's a lot of people on nowadays standards, in my opinion, on, not on mega cruises, but that's a lot of people. Uh, so it was overloaded, again, poor maintenance, so the, the faulty boiler equipment it was overcrowded, overloaded, and there was a fire, so that causes hysteria. It's just, it's one of those things that with one little thing, everything is just barely hanging on, and it just takes one, what, uh, matchstick to just set it all up. One little push. 
That's sad. And that's like the oldest that I see uh, on this list that I found. But that might be why, too, because it happened during a very pivotal time in our lives, like the end of the Civil War, the assassination of President Lincoln. But that might be why I don't recall it so well. Uh, and I don't remember the name, S.S. Sultana. I probably will remember it now in 1865. So those were the, the top seven cruise ship or passenger ship uh, disasters, but cruise ship disasters. And a lot of them, about oh, half of them involved wartime or war incidents. So that, that kind of, it shows you it was quite in the past. We have a few recent ones, mainly the Costa Concordia, of course, the Estonia in 1994. That, that one, I don't remember it being quite as bad as it is. And that, that's horrible, very horrible. And of course, you have the Carnival Triumph, which is dead at sea, but no one did um, lose their lives on that one. It's just a bad experience all around. So these ship disasters have had far-reaching consequences, obviously, prompting advance, advancements in safety regulations, we talked about that, emergency procedures, and the design and construction of cruise ships. Lessons learned from these tragedies have played a crucial role in improving the overall safety and security of passengers and crew in the crew industry. And again, going back to my recent cruise on the Carnival Horizon, which 100% was awesome, uh, very safe and we just got that uh, reiterated by taking the behind the scenes tour. I was very impressed with Carnival and I can only think that this is like a minimum of what they do. Uh, I'm sure there's even more stringent testing and safety protocols. We saw it on the walls and just, you know, people are graded on it. They're tested on it and we saw nothing but extra equipment. So you have your lifeboats, rafts, uh, life jackets um, but I was very impressed overall with the safety on my most recent cruise and I think the cruise industry is for the most part a safe business I think where anything happens is when someone goes against the SOP or the protocol whether that be the crew or a passenger or both I don't think ships now just get into trouble of course maybe a fire or something but they have they have even more state-of-the-art fire suppression fire tight doors, things that it stops oxygen in the in the room, not where people are, but say an engine room or areas like that. Anyway, it's just amazing technology. I feel 100% safe on board a carnival ship or any cruise ship that I've been on. Maybe not a casino cruise ship that I've been on. <laughs> that I wouldn't, a day, one of those day ones that you go out in, in, in international. Anyway, that was really rocky and it was a mile like a thunderstorm out there, but I wouldn't, anyway, that's another topic. But those were the top seven cruise disasters in American, well, in world history, actually. You know, scary, not forgotten, but we learned a lot. So let's keep cruising and let's remember the people who can't cruise anymore, basically. The crew and industries and governments that learn from these disasters and have changed or just improved in general, they're standard hopefully this wasn't too sad and it is history history is sometimes very sad but it is real and it really happened take that for what you will and let's keep cruising and keep vacationing but just remember the past so we don't repeat it and learn from it anyway thank you again for watching this has been another top seven series let's do it this way top seven series thank you so much Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. If you can, go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to see more. Bye!